a group uh, that included more administrators, coaches, um, but also teachers. Okay, and uh, I, I had the pleasure of sitting through it and learning, and um, also just had lunch with Louisa, and wish I could just keep talking. <laughs> Um, if we could all mine her brain for, for what she knows and the, the experience that she has. And I really wish that everything she talked about this morning, the idea that with the Common Core, we have to address foundational skills for kids, okay, especially kids who struggle. Uh, I really wish that, that we could really have everybody hear that because it's, it's the only realistic way we have of teaching all kids how to write with those foundational skills. So um, for the benefit of those of you who are new, let me um, introduce Dr. Motes, Dr. Louisa Motes. Um, found out at lunch that she um, is an East Coast person, grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, lived in Vermont, and then came west to California. Her first experience west was in California where she worked on um, a California reading initiative prior to reading first. Where I learned about Louisa, about her expertise, was through Reading First. So any of you that were involved in Reading First kinds of training probably learned from Louisa. Um, her background is that she was a teacher, a psychologist, a researcher, a um, university faculty member, uh, lately doing a lot of consulting, also the author of many articles, books, and, and educational programs. Primarily the one I'm most familiar with is letters. So raise your hand if letters is something you're familiar with. Hey. Okay. A program that um, when I was doing the letters training, I, as a special ed teacher who was supposed to be an expert in teaching kids who had trouble uh, with reading to teach them how to read, I, I was going, why was I not trained in this? Why didn't I learn? how to teach kids to read. Why did I not learn how to teach kids how to write? All those foundational skills. I've had to pick that up in the last 10 years because I wasn't trained that way. So we are very fortunate to have you here, Lisa, and I look forward to learning more from you. All right, thank you. I have a, I have a mic. I have a mic for two. Okay, 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 thank you. We'll use that for discussion okay, for if we need it. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you so much. Well, welcome, you uh, newbies, and welcome returning people. Um, this morning, uh, we talked in general terms about the difference, really, between the Common Core standards and the kind of lofty view of what we want kids to attain if they get really good at writing, and the reality of the struggles that kids have who are learning to write. And this afternoon, I'm going to be a lot more practical. I'm going to focus on techniques of instruction. I will tell you anything you want to know about my opinions about any programs you ask me about, the ones that I know, and then if we don't, if I don't know about programs, you can consult one another. So we'll put our heads together about the best tools for helping kids learn how to write. On being here, I um, I have to tell you, I expect it to be sunny and warm. <laughs> so be it. Okay. Uh, so this this afternoon's session is broken into uh, several different parts, and so um, the first part. In the first part, we're going to talk about teaching the foundational or so-called lower level skills of written composition, because if you weren't here this morning, um, the main point I made, and probably hammered to death for some of you, is that we can think of written composition or the ability to write as dependent on a combination of lower level transcription skills and higher level language processing. And these are coordinated by mental control processes and especially working memory and what we call um, metacognitive uh, sort of juggling of many ideas at once. This simple view of writing is analogous to the simple view of reading, and the simple view of reading says that reading comprehension is a product 
of automatic word recognition and language comprehension. So uh, in writing, writing is a product of lower level skills, including handwriting and spelling, and being able to uh, get the words on the page, and higher level language processing. So in order to be good teachers, we have to have approaches, methods, tools, materials, and instructional time allotted to these aspects of writing in proportion to what our students need. Because novice writers are going to need more time, probably on building the foundations, and proficient writers are going to need more time, relatively speaking, on higher level language processing. Um, so, one of the things we emphasized this morning, and I showed a lot of research results, uh, Steve Graham, uh, many of you have heard speak or know about, has shown over and over again that handwriting fluency and accuracy has a positive effect on composition quality and quantity. So if kids know how to form the letters, they're going to be more able to develop fluency and transcription, and that is going to free up their minds for composition. So what about teaching handwriting? We, see we were uh, saying this morning that um, in some states, you may have even read about this, that there are state board level discussions about handwriting policy and whether handwriting should be taught or not. So I'll just tell you what I think and then you can take it from there. Okay, I think that the consensus among knowledgeable practitioners is that we should start teaching uh, uh, lowercase manuscript letters first. Why? Because they're most necessary. So we don't want to teach kids how to write in capital letters from the beginning. You only need capital letters in certain places in words, right? Uh, for proper nouns in the beginning of sentences and so on. So they need the lowercase letters. And then we do need to teach the uppercase. The reason we teach manuscript first generally is that the strokes are simpler. You can have circles and straight lines, which most of the letters are made up of in manuscript. Those are easier for kids with um, just who are just developing motor skills to coordinate. Cursive is taught either in grades two or three, depending on the school system. Um, generally, I would say more often it's taught in third grade than second grade, but there is no research that tells you when to do it. And if you're so inclined to teach kids cursive from the outset, and there's somebody who has established that policy in your school, well, go for it. There is no research that I know of that tells you that that's necessarily a terrible thing. It's just that the motor coordination of cursive, um, the, the demands of motor coordination are greater for cursive, and that's why we usually wait a little bit to teach cursive. And why bother with cursive at all, you might ask, and this is being asked, if you can believe it, at state board meetings. Because, first of all, we have to be able to read cursive. People still write in cursive. So, uh, have you ever had kids who couldn't read cursive? Because they hadn't been taught how to write cursive? I've known a lot of those. It looks more mature. And how writing looks is important. And third, it is more fluent. You can write more fluently if you can link the letters together in words. And actually, there's another reason for cursive, which is that you can develop a motor habit for a whole word by writing it in cursive in a way that's a little bit qualitatively a little different from writing it as separate, unconnected letters. So for all those reasons, I would still come down on the side of, yes, we should teach cursive. And then someone's going to say, well, where do I get the time to do that? OK, well, I can't solve that. 
Okay, then um, the next principle on the slide is to group letters the way they're formed. We want a writing program that does not just teach the alphabet in order, because that doesn't make sense when you're talking about letter formation. We want the letters grouped in some logical way. Now, again, this is like a lot of things in writing instruction. There is no one best way to do it, but there are sources for um, good advice about how to group the letters together. Um, the Zaner Blozer Company, everybody know about that? Specializes in handwriting and spelling materials. They have good systems for doing that. <coughs> Suzanne Carriker at the, at the Nye House Center in Houston has written good chapters about handwriting instruction and gives advice about how to group the letters together by their basic strokes. Um, she has written a chapter in Judith Bursch's book called um, Multisensory Teaching of Basic Language Skills. So Suzanne Carriker is a good person. Um, Kay Allen is another person who's written a chapter in that book. So there are experts who, who, uh, who offer you systems for grouping these letters together. And then use lined paper. Now this may sound simple and obvious, but I go into classrooms a lot where kids are given blank pieces of paper. No spatial guidelines. Um, that's not a good idea because the kids are trying to train their hands to move within certain spaces. They need all the help we can give them with red lines and green lines and dotted lines and solid lines and green line and the left margin and arrows and anything we can do. Posture and grip. Kids who are sitting on the floor. Writing like this are not are at a disadvantage. Writing, especially with the kids who are struggling writers, you want to have them seated at a desk, upright in a chair, so that they can relax their arm as they learn to move their hand. And if they're upside down on the floor or something, it's harder to deal with that. If you have kids who are left-handed, they um, need uh, an adjustment in the way their paper is laid. How many lefties do we have here? It's usually um, uh, the ratio of lefties to righties is generally, I think, about uh, 1 to 10. Is that right? Or is it 20%? Anyway, it looks like about 20% in this class. But, so when you uh, those of you who are lefties, do you remember learning how to write? Do you remember having a teacher who made adaptations for you? Or did you just have to learn like a right handed person? Anybody want to speak to that? My mom taught kindergarten. Your mom taught kindergarten, so she knew how to help you. Very good. What about you? I noticed that. I, I never really thought about this, but I noticed a lot of left handed people write. Right, and if you're left-handed, I can't replicate this very well, but your paper slam will be uh, this way. For a right-handed person, it will be opposite. Opposite. Oh, opposite. There you go. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. I better not say that. Okay. Um, yes. The question from the online group. Yeah. Is there any way to change? Bad writing grip habits. Um, uh, great question. Bad writing grip habits. Uh, several things are, uh, that come to mind for me. One is change the size of the writing implements, make it a little bit larger. Another is there are little pencil grip things you can buy to put on a pencil that reinforce a three finger grip. Um, you can get them from certain school supply stores or the uh, Educators Publishing Service, for example, or Zaner Blozer, I'm sure, sells those. Um, uh, but probably what the person, I don't have any writing implements up here. Um, here's a suggestion. If a student has, oh, thank you, okay, some kids try to write like that. You know, and then, or like, like that. 
that or you want to, if it's really um, maladaptive, should we say, you want to try and get the student to learn a three finger grip. But often what's at the basis of that is underdeveloped motor skills in general. So one of the things uh, that I, I remember way back when I was teaching young kids, <coughs> way back, I would start them always with large motor practice on a chalkboard. And these days, we don't seem to have chalkboards anymore the kid, where kids can stand up and make the movements large as they're learning to write the letter. But it, we would practice things like making large circles, and then we'd stop at the top, and we'd go in the other direction on, on cue. And then we would learn how to make a diagonal this way and that way. And we'd learn how to start at the left and cross the midline and go to the right. And we, we would, um, oh, let's see, learn to uh, change directions. So I'd, play a little game with them. If I put a dot here, start here, and then I'd put a dot somewhere around, and I we we look like a couple of you know overactive um, monkeys up there jumping around, and a student would have to aim, you know, control where the motion went, and those were very old uh, visual motor skills. Um, that I'm saying old in that in special ed we used to emphasize those more than we tend to now. That would help the student master the motions of letter formation with the whole arm and, and the whole body. And then it would be easier for them to make the transition to the small motor control that's involved in just using the wrist and the fingers. So, you probably be, you probably need to pay attention to what your um, occupational therapist tells you if you have a student with a really aberrant grip, but you do want to try and deal with that. Um, also, in the literature on how best to teach letter formation, you want to name the letter as it's written because some kids don't know what letter it is that they're making. <laughs> so you just want them to say the letter name as they're saying the form. And then um, uh, what Virginia Bringer emphasizes a lot in her book, her book is called Teaching Students with Dyslexia and Dysgraphia. It's a Brooks Publishing um, publication. It's an excellent book with lots of practical advice. Uh, Virginia Berninger, B E R N I N G E R, uh, from the University of Washington. And the title of the book is Teaching Students with Dyslexia and Dysgraphia. It's a Brooks Publishing book. And she uh, co wrote it with uh, a teacher, Beverly Wolf, who's very, very practical. She'll tell you exactly how to do everything and how do you manage this kind of student and that kind of student. So you want to name the lines that the letter is put on. So you have a reference point. And in Readwell, for example, they talk about the hat line, the belt line, and the foot line. So you have a point of reference to refer to. And then you want to provide frequent distributed practice. That is, 10 minutes a day of practice is much better than half an hour once a week. Um, teach it in kindergarten. <laughs> we talked about that this morning. Because if kids develop habits in the first place, they're going to develop writing fluency much more readily. And then um, you want to be accurate before fluent. And there should be visual models on the students' desks. This is very easy to do. Get a card that has the alphabet as you want it written and paste it on the students' desk. And try not to let kids invent letter formation. You want to tell them that there is a way to do it that is better than another way. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We had that question this morning. What do you do with a second and third grader who learned it and has a habit of going clockwise when they should 
to go counterclockwise and so on, and their letters are poorly formed. Well, all I can suggest is that you you try to reteach them, and once in a while you'll get a student who's just so resistant to relearning that they're they're not that it's kind of water over the dam. But I would say try. You need a good material that provides good practice. It is worthwhile trying to reteach and give them sufficient practice so they really retrain their their, their graphomotor memory. You're establishing a motor memory for that letter. Um, and it's probably not too late at that point if you're willing to spend the time. So I'm going to teach you how to make a letter. Everybody have a piece of paper they can write on? I thought I would have one screen up here, but I have two, so I'll jump around with it. Okay, do you have a piece of paper? I want you to put uh, three lines like the ones I have here, a hat line, a belt line, and a shoe line. over here and then I'll demonstrate over there. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to write the letter A. The name of this letter is A. What's the name? A. Thank you. Now watch me first. I'm going to go up and around and down, around this way, up to here, across, up, back, and around, down, and stop. Okay? So, and I'm going to, actually, my letter should be a little bigger. I should touch the belt line and the shoe line. Okay, so let me show you one more time. This is A. What's the name of the letter? A. And watch me. I'm going to start here. I'm going to go up, around, down, back around, up to here, over, back around, and down to the what, shoe line and stop. Now, what I should have for you is something to trace. Now, you can go ahead and see if you can do that while I show them over here. All right. So, what ideally, what you would have is not just this on a slide, you have it on a piece of paper so that you can trace it with me. But I want to demonstrate and verbally describe what I'm doing as I'm making the letters. The letter name is A. What's the letter name? A. I'm going to start here below the belt line. I'm going to go up, around, down, back, around, over, over, up, around, down, and stop. And this letter is between the belt line and the shoe line. Now, admittedly, I picked something that would be challenging for you guys, right? <laughs> so, um, you should have a letter to trace, but because you don't have a letter to trace, you're just going to have to try it. Go ahead. To help you further, I could put numbers to show that you that number one is where you start in case you forgot where you were going to start. Did, would anybody like another demonstration? Or do you, do you have a just that? And I could put more arrows and numbers. So I could say this is first we go this way and then the second we go around this way. That's the second thing you do. And we can have a third piece which is going across this way. 
And then we're going to have to go up back to the ground. And down. Okay? So uh, adding numbers and arrows for a complex letter is helpful because a lot of kids, even if you show them, they don't know where to start. And especially um, with a simple letter like D, they'll start, instead of starting at the top and going down, you've seen a lot of kids who do this who are motorically mature, they'll start at the bottom and go up. And then they'll go try to make a circle. So to establish that start point, to have numbers and arrows and a verbal routine is what's helpful. Um, okay, how did you do with your act? Looking pretty good? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> really? You mean you need more practice? Another demonstration? And then typically what we do is say we'll make five more of them, and then when you're done, circle the one that you think looks the most like the model. So you get students to examine their own efforts, and they know that the rough approximation sometimes, and then the student can see which one looks the best and make that judgment themselves. I'm just getting you a pointer. Oh, thank you. Well, actually, I have a pointer. I just neglected to use it. I just thought that might be helpful. <laughs> somewhat um, uh, uh, an imaginary model of how you actually teach someone to form a letter. But there is research, again, numbered arrows, verbal cues, and well-defined spaces, and all those things help. Okay, any other questions about just teaching letter formation? Okay, one question would be the pace at which you do this, and I would say you teach one letter at a time until the kids have it. And hopefully, think about that grouping. If you had other letters that started where you go up, back, around, and down, you would group those together rather than the alphabet sequence. Um, just, I'm just curious, how many of you feel that you have very good materials for teaching <coughs> handwriting at this point? Oh, not everybody. Okay, so this is a need. Uh, every, whoever's in charge of this, take note that we have a lot of people here who are wondering where they're going to get good materials and resources for doing this. All right, very good. Um, so does keyboarding substitute for handwriting? We were talking this morning about the standards mentioning technology and the production of uh, written work through keyboard. Um, and handwriting is not mentioned in the standards. Keyboarding is not mentioned in the standards. And I was trying to make the case that this is really problematic because there's reason for teaching handwriting. Keyboarding, um, <coughs> just think about it. Um, it can't substitute for handwriting, first of all, because there are going to be lots of instances where handwriting is necessary, and we won't be able to just push buttons for letters. Handwriting supports memory for letters and memory for spelling words. There is something about the kinesthetic feel of the motion of the hand making letters that helps us remember how to spell things. So there's this, this graphomotor memory that's involved in writing that you don't get the same sense of by keyboarding. And um, of course, computers are not always available. And uh, it takes students a while to develop fluency with keyboarding to the point where they can actually compose with keyboarding. One of Ginger Berninger's studies was with fourth grade students, and I'm trying to think which journalist was in, but she cites it in her book, where they compared the quality of compositions that fourth graders were producing with the keyboard versus handwritten compositions. And she <coughs> said, it was a fairly small sample book, but she was getting better results with handwritten compositions than she was getting with 
keyboarded compositions at the fourth grade level, which suggests to me that if we're really going to start testing kids with tight compositions, it may be more realistic to think about that for fifth grade and up, and also to make allowances for kids who have not developed the requisite fluency with the keyboard. Um, yes. They have to handwrite the first thing and then type it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds um like uh. I think it's I mean I'm gonna really low low like the low. Yeah. 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 That wouldn't be successful. Okay, so the question was, um, it, or, or the observation: the kids are asked to write everything out first and then type it. And uh, I think that um, that's okay as an intermediate step, as long as they are also working on building proficiency in keyboarding. Because at some point, they have to be fluent enough. They have to take the whole test. They will have to take the test. Okay. Oh, oh, I see. They take the test and. And then writing by hand and then typing. Well, I don't think that's what the standards are aiming at, but I do understand that that may be a strategy that you have to use at this point to get those kids to succeed because they're not fluent enough with keyboarding. And that sounds pretty adaptive. Um, you you want to continue to build their fluency with keyboarding and with also computer-based editing tools and all that, you've got to continue to work on it. Yes, it changes with the second language issue in that um, uh, with second language learners, because they're trying to just handle language, I would think that you might want to just emphasize the handwritten medium in the beginning and maybe not worry so much about keyboarding until they reach a certain level of proficiency. So I think that's that would be my reference. Okay. They have to enter it on the computer. Yeah. For those kids, we've got more than Okay, well that complicates things because you want to focus on building their capacity with verbal expression, knowledge of vocabulary and all that. You don't you want to simplify the extraneous demands and focus on the things that really matter. And if they're overburdened by keyboarding as well as everything else, it doesn't sound very productive. All right, good. Um, okay, so let's shift to spelling. Yeah. Junior high age kids. Yes. Would you still work on Well, I would. And um, not everyone's going to agree with me, but the question is with junior high kids who are still poor writers, here's the reason why I would. Um, I would continue, I would see if I could teach them how to write by hand. Uh, and also, I'd have a lab where they were working on keyboarding. But if they're writing by hand, first of all, they're going to get a that extra feedback for the letters that are in words that they're writing that, that you don't get by keyboarding and they need all the help they can get establishing word habits for spelling. Secondly, I think writing by hand um, allows them to be more reflective about what it is they're trying to say. Um, but, and I think a lot of them can be retaught how to write the letters. The reason I think that is that mainly from the work of Diana King, who ran this place called the Kildonan School back in New York, and who demonstrated over and over again that many of her students who, who had so-called dysgraphia, you know, illegible handwriting, could be taught how to write. And these were kids who were 12 years old and up. They could be taught how to write quite legibly and it was very helpful for them and a necessary tool in life to be able to write a note or a letter or a report 
Um, it's legible. So, yes, I think it can be done. It's a matter of choice of instructional time and resources. If you only have that student for half an hour, it's going to be tough to figure out how to teach that student everything they need. And you may have to do a lot of collaborating. Uh, you know, it's an individual case very long. All right, spelling. Um, this morning, we looked at research on the relationship between spelling and writing. And we see over and over again that those students who are better spellers can produce compositions of higher quality and greater quantity. In other words, if you can spell and you're not thinking about how to spell want and went and when, when you write, you can put your mind on things like which words you need to describe what you're trying to say. You can think about the goal of the writing you're trying to do. You can think about your audience. You can think about your sentence structure. You can think about linking ideas. But when you struggle with writing every other word, all of those higher level skills are sacrificed to some extent or to a great extent. So spelling is extremely important. And we continue in education to treat it like a poor relation in many places. Um, and I don't know if that's happened here. But even if we're doing a good job teaching composition, we do need good systematic explicit spelling instruction that emphasizes the regular patterns in the language. Uh, for kids who have writing difficulties, who want to emphasize multisensory techniques, and we'll demonstrate what those are, but they involve um, saying and writing at the same time. We want to emphasize the patterns that words share in English so the student is not just memorizing every word as an isolated <laughs> item, but is thinking, establishing a sense of orthography and how orthography works in English. We want to limit the number of non-pattern or so-called sight words that are taught at any one time. Um, for some kids, they may be able to handle three of those a week. Some kids one a week. Some kids five a week. We want to introduce those very gradually. And then we want to give kids a lot of practice with uh, dictation, with closed exercises, and with uh, using the words in written expression. We want to avoid this. Here's a student. I mean, there's really no point in giving a spelling test to a student who is getting half of the words correct. It means that we haven't given the student the requisite instructional experience and practice to enable them to be successful. Um, also, if you look at this uh, in this spelling list, only one own, two, saw, whose, whom, and many on one spelling test. And this is Let's see, I think this was a second grader. It's just not an appropriate list to give a student, especially a student who has a poor memory for words. And this, anybody um, want to um, take a different position about this? I made a pretty strong statement. I don't think it's the right thing to do to give kids a list like this in second grade when they're not being successful. But it happens all the time. What? <laughs> um, so how can you build their muscles, so to speak, to get okay. there? All right, how good. OK, so first of all, you want to give them the number of words that you think that they can learn and handle. So if you have kids who are extremely poor spellers, the goal for that week might be three words. Um, the second thing you want to do is emphasize patterns in general, unless you have a, a student who really is yeah. a, a, an exception to this, who is not able to learn the patterns. And we, maybe that one you were talking to me about. We'll see. But so there, there are so many patterns in the language that can be taught and emphasized. These words are all are non-patterns. 
<coughs> the word own, O W N, does start with a letter O, but it's not um, going to be the same spelling pattern as in the word only or the word one. And if a student has a poor memory for words, uh, it might be better, for example, if you're teaching O W as a pattern for the sound O. To group the word own with, what else do you think of? Um, well, is there any other word you can think of where OW represents the sound O and not the sound O? Oh, oh, like snow, like snow. Okay? So snow, S N O W, has the same vowel spelling as the OW in the word own. Now, O-W is also used for the sound ow, but I wouldn't put that in the same lesson for a really lousy speller. That's a different lesson on how do we spell the sound ow. But if you're teaching a long O sound first, before you teach ow, which I would do, and you're teaching the vowel team for uh, the sound O, I would teach that the sound O is spelled O-W in this list of words, and one of those words is the word own. And then I would see how many of these words can the student handle. And then once they see the pattern, then you want to give them enough practice through dictation and using the words in the context that they develop some uh, what we call word-specific memories for those words. Because you cannot spell by pattern alone. The patterns are the vehicle for establishing memories for the words. So you, the best spellers understand the patterns and have specific word memories. So it's a two-pronged thing. Um, the word saw should not be in there. You know, A-W, O-W. At the same time, this is this is a spelling disabled student. Call them what you will. Um, all right, so we need a list that makes sense and that emphasizes the patterns. We want to figure out how, how much practice a student needs before they can show us mastery. So we'll have to gauge student by student. These sort are of the quantity of learning and the pace of learning that student handle. If they're getting half of the words right on some kind of test, we're probably going to need to make an adjustment. I had, as I was saying this morning, one student, a uh, second grader, sent me a copy of her spelling test and she got 15 words wrong out of 16 words. And I was saying to myself, who, who's looking at this? You know, and this, then a student, very sweet, girl wrote me a letter over the internet. Dear Dr. Motes, when I look at my spelling words, I get a headache. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I get a headache. Um, all right, so we're talking about patterns in English. We do not want to have a random list of words where the patterns don't <coughs> coincide. And those words like who's and many and saw that are uh, maybe high frequency words that we want the kids to know, we're going to titrate them in just a, a few at a time and do a lot of tracing and um, trying to get the student to memorize through visualization. But mainly we're going to teach this stuff about how the language works. Syllable and phoneme segmentation. Phoneme graphing mapping. And I'll show you that on the next slide. We're going to practice a lot with word sorting and word building and, and manipulatives if we can. We're going to do dictation where the kids have to write the symbols for the sounds. They have to write words. They have to write sentences or phrases. We're going to add some speed drills in there and some proofreading activities to reinforce what we've taught. And we're going to make sure that the kids use the words in context. We may have to set them up for that, so we might have to write a little story where there are blanks for where those words go, 
Because if we only deal with lists, then there's not likely to be a lot of transfer into writing. And we know because we work with kids who struggle that even if we do all of this, that half the time the kids aren't going to remember it the next day and we'll have to go through this all over again. That's the nature of a spelling disability. And there are many people like this in the world. So let's take these one piece at a time. Um, phoneme graphing mapping is a technique that I think is extremely valuable. Um, a resource manual for you to be able to do this is written by Catherine Grace, G-R-A-C-E, and it's called Phonics and Spelling Through Phoneme Graphing Mapping. Um, or if you just look up phoneme graphing mapping, you can probably find it on the internet. It's a little handbook that she put together. Kathy Grace was the teacher of the year in Vermont many years ago, and a student of mine in the 1990s or something. She took everything I taught her. She invented this strategy, which she used for her second and third grade students. And she swore up and down that this was the most powerful thing she'd ever done with her students, and it turned them into much better readers and writers. So what she did was take a grid, like math, um, a grid paper with enlarged uh, blocks, um, and she would take a word pattern and show kids how each of the letters in the word mapped to the speech sound in the word. So what I have here um, is maybe a lesson that she would do on our controlled vowels, or vowel R pattern. Maybe this would be about um, a beginning third grade level where the kids had already studied the way you spell er and r. So she might have a word list where each of the words would have an r controlled vowel in it. And the technique is this. The students would say a word. They would have a word list already. And then they would map how the letters were. So if the first word was star, she would say, OK, kids, what's the word? What's the word, everybody? Star. Let's say the sounds. R. Right? So there are three. How many sounds in star? Three. So how many boxes will we need for the letters? Three. We will need three, because I forgot to tell you that each box stands for a phoneme or a speech sound in the word. So then we map the word. What's the first sound? What's the first letter going to be? S. What's the second sound? What's the second letter going to be? T. What's the third sound? R. What do I put in that third box? A. A R. Why do I put two letters in that box? Because it stands for one sound. Thank you. So that's the instructional dialogue that goes along with this. This is not an activity of pushing letters into boxes. This is an activity of consciously associating the way we spell each of the phonemes in a word that is regular. Okay? Now, before this lesson, I would have already taught the kids that when we say the sound R in English, we spell it with A R. I would have taught them that. And it is somewhat arbitrary whether or not you can, you're can. you going to treat that as a unitized sound. So that's a choice that this approach has already made. It's one that we make in letters. For example, we advise teachers to teach the vowel R combinations as units. Uh, they were just asking, what's the name? Kathy Grace. Kathy Grace, G-R-A-C-E. And the title of the book is Phonics and Spelling through Phoneme Graphing Mapping. So Phoneme Graphing Mapping is in the title. And it's a you know pretty slim, not so expensive handbook. There aren't any student materials. All you need is a, an overhead projector or a smart board that has a grid on it uh, where you can, uh, and best, I think, is the um, grid paper for the kids, and they can move chips into the boxes as they're seeing the sounds, and then they 
or they can move letter tiles into the boxes as they're spelling each of the phonemes in the word. Um, uh, so let's take a more difficult one, slurped. The word slurped. Now you're a third grader who is progressing very well because you've been taught. Okay, what's the word we're going to map? It is slurped. slurped. Let's say the sounds. Right, what's the last sound in slurped? Very good. Okay, the last sound in slurped is Okay, now let's map the letters in this word. Okay, we have in the first <coughs> S, school will be L. Er, what letters? R. And then what goes in the last box? E-D. E-D, because that E-D tells us that the word is what? A past tense. And what is the sound that the E-D makes in that word? Correct. And I would have already taught the kids, and here's the, in terms of prerequisite skills, I would have already taught them that ED has three sounds in English. It has the sound D, the sound T, and the sound ED, the syllabic uh, version of ED. Okay? A lot of you uh, know these things, which is very good. Um, so it's splurge, for example. GE will go in one box because the E has a function. It marks that G as having its soft sound. But that's also something I would have taught. So each of these elements that gets mapped is preceded by explicit direct instruction where we explain it to kids how it works. We tell them we're not stingy. And this is a little different from the discovery approach, where you give kids a lot of words that have something like um, GE on the end or DGE, and you say, how do you think it works? Or remember Anita Archer, she says it's always better just to tell them. Okay? Yeah. Just tell them. Because <coughs> it's hard enough. Yeah. How is this different from using it isn't, except that it takes the Elkonin boxes farther into the structure of orthography. So the Elkonin boxes are the boxes in the grid, but I think of Elkonin boxes as the tool you use for the phoneme awareness part. And in the very beginning of phoneme graphing mapping, what Kathy Grace recommends is Elkonin boxes, where you have chips. So you you first work on segmenting the sounds. And then as you teach the orthography and you have these word lists with regular spelling patterns, then you use these boxes to map it. Then, of course, after the kids have mapped the words, they have to write the whole word as a unit. But they write the whole word with a sense of the internal details and how they work. That's what's missing in kids with specific language disabilities. And it's kind of the common denominator is that kids are not able to pay attention to the internal details of either, either the spoken word or the written word and they're not noticing how it works. We have to point that out to them and make sure they know it's like the inner workings of the machine. And once they get some insight into that, they have handles, better handles for remembering whole words. They still have to go through the process of writing the whole words and using the whole words, and um, they still will have to um, develop those whole word habits. But it is easier to remember something you understand than something that makes no sense to you. All right, so how about syllabication? What about longer words? You may work with a lot of kids who are. Um, who are older, so we have to work at a syllable level. And with this, we want to make sure that kids say the words that they're spelling. Why is that? Anybody, can anybody tell me why it's so important to say? So they're connecting the phony <coughs> to the graphene. Yes, that's right. In the act of saying the word out loud, they have to connect the phonemes with the graphene. It's, spelling should not be silent. 
it should be connected with oral language. Because these are kids, our kids are, don't do this internally automatically. We have to get them to verbalize, to realize spoken language. And another subtle thing, which we don't emphasize enough, is that in the act of speaking, we activate the articulators. That is, the, the mouth, lips, teeth, and tongue that are required to actually form a word as a vocal gesture. And that formation of the word also enhances kids' awareness of what is in the word. Um, and look, heaven knows what goes on inside their heads when you don't ask them to say it out loud. It's often a rough approximation of the word, and we, we all know kids like that. Okay, so we want to say the word aloud. The students repeat it. Then the students segment the word orally using the duck whip strategy. So suppose I want to teach you, um, what do I have on oh, coming up here? Okay, I want to teach you how to write the word informer. Okay, say the word informer. Informer. Now I want you to say it using duck lips, and that means you hold your lips together with your hands, and now say the word. Okay, very good. Did you feel how many how many vowel sounds did you say when you said that? Three. Okay, each push of breath, each time you had to go hmm and make a humming sound, you were making a vowel sound. So how many syllables will your words have? Three, because every syllable has a vowel in it. That's what a syllable is. Syllable is a unit of speech organized around a vowel sentence. Okay, so that's why duck lips works. You can't say the word without making a vowel sound. And that's your cue that you're going to need three syllable squares to write that word. And then I saw you um, with the hand under the chin. That's another way of telling how many syllables in former your chin drops a little bit every time you have to make a vowel sound. And that's also a good strategy, but I think that duck lips is foolproof. Yeah, <laughs> foolproof, it works. And the kids have fun, you know, duck lips. And then, um, and then you want the kids to write the spelling of each syllable on an index card or a spelling grid that has room for the syllables. And the students check the spelling of each syllable before writing the whole word. So, um, if so, we might lay it out like this, where we have a grid, and we, we've graduated from phoneme graphing mapping to syllable mapping, and they have to write out each syllable and then write the whole word. In the act of doing this, again, they're paying attention to the internal details. They're paying attention to what is in each syllable. And our kids who have phonological weaknesses often don't pay attention to each of the syllables. And one of the classic spelling errors I'm sure you see is the deletion of syllables that are in the middle of a word or that are unaccented. It's a telltale sign. Uh, we see a great deal in kids who have um, a tenure for language. Um, and all of these, yeah, all of these have R controlled vowels in them. So this might be um, for older kids who are beyond the phoneme graphing mapping stage. Um, now, what do we do about regular high frequency words? I have put a couple of slides together for you on methods that are tried and true for remembering words like many or does or whom. Um, and uh, so um, one technique is to use manipulative letter tiles to have the kids spell and then you get them to um, to form an image with their mental camera saying look hard at that, form an image and then you have them turn the tiles over so they're facing down. And then you see if the image that they've made is strong enough, they can identify what is sort of on the reverse side of each of those blank letters. And then they can turn it up. It's like a concentration game. They can turn up that tile and see if they got the right letter in that place. And then they have to, um, uh, one of these techniques, they identify the letters in reverse order and then in forward order and then try to write the whole word from memory themselves. 
So that's one technique that's a visualization kind of technique. And it should be applied to the irregular words again. So there's um, a summary of the most common <coughs> irregular words. When I did um, an analysis of the most commonly misspelled words of intermediate level kids, um, they commonly misspelled these so-called simple high frequency words. Do, D-O, terrible problem, of, O-F, terrible problem, does. And why is it so difficult? Because you can't spell by sound. You have to form a, a word image. Um, and then the second method is the tracing and writing method. I'm not going to go through every step here. That's there on the slide for your reference. This is for, from the old, what we call the Fernal technique many years ago. Tracing the word until there's a motor habit established uh, along with the visual memory and then trying to write it from memory. As far as the scope and sequence for teaching spelling, um, I have one that goes grades one to eight. If you need a scope and sequence for how these patterns roll out, I have that. I thought I sent it in. I don't know if you have a copy of that. Yeah, if you do, okay, yeah. great. Okay. <laughs> And then this, if, even if you do all these wonderful things, you're very diligent, you work with your students very hard, the reality is it's much harder to fix a spelling disability than it is to fix a reading disability. It's much harder to fix a poor speller than a poor reader. And what will happen if you do a great job with instruction is you'll have many kids who progress in reading much faster than they progress in spelling. You'll have a number of kids who plateau at what we think of as a third to fourth grade level in spelling, and you will feel discouraged if you just look at standardized tests. What you're trying to do is to improve their approximations of, of words enough that they will be able to use a spell checker productively by about fifth grade level, and that they realize they need proofreading help, and you will give them um, other technological supports. But you cannot continue to punish kids as teachers. You know this. I'm saying the obvious. They can, these kids suffer terribly with their problems. And you've got to find ways of um, grading them on other aspects of their writing, um, giving them coping strategies. And you're not letting them off the hook. This is just something that's very difficult to fix. And I learned that lesson the hard way. I thought, oh, I know how to do it. I know all about spelling. I worked a whole year with half a sixth grader on the words there, there, and there, trying to get him to spell them. It didn't work. He just could not learn. He just could not do it. Um, so we, we gave up. <laughs> um, all right. And a personal spelling dictionary, um, proofreading reminders. Those kinds of things can be helpful. Um, spell checkers, you need to be able to spell at about a fifth grade level to use a spell checker. <laughs> right? Because otherwise, there are going to be homophones that it doesn't pick up. There will be real word spellings that it doesn't pick up. It can be very embarrassed. So you've got to let your students know they still need proofreading assistance. Um, and word prediction software, it's helpful, but again, it's not going to be a total solution for, for kids who have this kind of disorder. Um, the sentence sense, I realize that clock is right and that clock is wrong. I have to remember that. Okay, let's say something about this. Okay, the sentence sense. The next thing in terms of building skills is going to be sentence level composition. So, uh, and I love this quote, the sentence itself is a story with a beginning, middle, and end. Something happens in a sentence. Without subjects, there are no heroes or villains. Without verbs, there's no action. Without objects, nothing is moved, changed, destroyed, or created. Great. I'm going to watch your post, just a letter somebody, somebody uh, sent in. So the, um, the concept of a sentence is very abstract. And it takes kids a long time to grasp this. We are working now on a program with middle school kids who struggle 
to identify what's a complete sentence, what's an incomplete sentence, how do these parts work. So you start at kindergarten, but if this is every year you need to do this. Um, and the idea that it's a group of words that expresses a complete thought, okay, that's good, but what's a complete thought? You know, this is very hard to define. Uh, and that definition, it doesn't really ring true to a kid who doesn't get it, nor does it help to say it has a capital in the beginning and a period at the end, because it's an abstract concept that it's about, uh, actually I like this diagram better, it's about a subject and a predicate. It has to have a naming part and an action part. And this basic diagram is what we, we need to work on in the beginning. Um, speech language therapists do this a lot, so they have tools and techniques that ought to be shared more widely with, with teachers. But um, uh, one of the strategies is to use basic question words for each of these basic parts of the sentence. So the naming part has to do with the what kind, the how many, the who or what. And then uh, what the subject did has to do with when, where, how, to whom, and what. So <coughs> if you're going to be working a lot, uh, building sentence sense with those questions, and a device we use a lot is called a sentence builder chart, where you identify the, the, the required part of the sentence, which is in the dark blocks there. It has to have a who or what. And it has to have a verb. It has to have an is or is doing part. Everything else is optional. Then what we do is gradually teach kids to add on information that answers these other questions. And our, actually our strategy, our particular strategy with middle school kids is to focus on the predicate first. To focus on um, answering the questions where, when, how, uh, for whom, to what, and then going back to the subject and asking for elaboration about what kind or how many uh, words that will describe that subject. Um, in uh, the, the sentence writing curriculum, it's more than a sentence writing curriculum, Judith Hoffman's work on building sentences is really outstanding uh, called basic, Teaching Basic Writing Skills. Her name, Hoffman, is spelled H-O-C-H-M-A-N. Uh, teaching Basic Writing Skills from, um, I guess, Sopris published that, and she also publishes it herself. But she builds from simple sentences to compound sentences to complex sentences very systematically. She uses sentence combining techniques and sentence elaboration techniques, but what's different about her work is she's very definite about what she wants students to do each step of the way. So it's not just a walk in the park with something that sounds good. It's very clear about um, how to build a compound using a certain uh, connecting word. So sentence combining has a lot of support in the research literature. But a sentence combining curriculum should also have a scope and sequence where the aim is to get kids to construct certain kinds of sentences. Uh, some of these materials are kind of unstructured and don't have a clear progression. I think for struggling writers, we need a progression. Bruce Sadler has written a book about teaching sentences that just came out this past year. He's an expert in this and has lots of great advice for you. Um, I think Guilford is the publisher of Bruce Sadler's book on sentence combining and building sentence writing skills. You have very good advice. Um, let me get through a couple more things here and then we'll take a little break. Okay, and then parts of speech. We mentioned this this morning. How do we teach parts of speech? And I said that based on the research, the question is how best to do this, not whether or not we need to do it. Because kids have to be able to name the roles that words play in sentences. So again, each of these parts of speech is there to answer a certain question. 
right? The noun says the who or what, and the pronoun as well. When you get to something like an article of or the, it's which one or what. Or you get to the adverb, how, uh, uh, when, where, why. Um, preposition tells you about the relationship between things. Um, if I were working all day with you on this, I'd have you generate more examples of this, but this is the big idea, that we need to teach parts of speech for a number of reasons. We need to teach a way, the numbers are out of order here, to think about words in relationship to their functions. We need to be able to name the role that a word plays in a sentence. We need to be able to um, teach kids to pay attention to this when they're spelling because if I say spell the word past, what are you going to write? Well, um, the quarterback passed the ball to the <laughs> context. And that's a homophone. But it's the part of speech of the word and that your ability to process that in the context of the sentence that tells you how to spell it. Um, okay, and then we want to identify whether sentences are complete. I can't tell you how many adults I work with who write in incomplete sentences. And, and then to talk about word choice in sentences. You have a string of adjectives here and it would be better if you had a strong noun. You have a string of adverbs here. It would be better if you had a strong verb and you took out the adverbs. You have a string of prepositional phrases here, and it would be better to have a relative clause. Now, that's the vocabulary to give feedback about better, stronger writing. You have to have that vocabulary to have that conversation. So those are all the reasons why this needs to be taught. Now the question is how best to do it. And um, I think we still need a grammar strand in language arts where there's actually a workbook or online practice or something because it's not enough to do this on the fly. It's not enough to say. And I can't tell you how many times I've said to my colleagues, you have run two sentences together and you need to put a semicolon between them or you need to put a comma and a connective. Well, they keep on doing it. <laughs> because, and then I learned that it's not enough to say you need a semicolon. What they never got was a week's worth of practice with a list of sentences that needed semicolon. This is hard, and it can't be done on the fly. I don't know what you all do, but I'd just be interested. How many of you have materials for teaching basic grammar? A few? Good for you. Are you all in the same district? No? OK, a few of you. But see, see that's maybe 20% of you. And it's and what you're dealing with is symptomatic. It's not just here. It's everywhere. And I suspect that there are districts here, I've already talked to you, that are doing a better job than people are on average. Because the prevailing view has been, if you just get the kids to write, that somehow they'll figure all this out. Well, the data I showed this morning verifies that they're not just figuring it out. And um, I'll, I'll just. OK, we'll have a break, but I just want to tell you this. Um, and why is this important? Because even if you're going to be, just think of your students. Your students may not go to Yale University. You know, your students may uh, go into um, you know, something that doesn't require a high level of verbal ability, but they still are going to have to write something about themselves on an application. They're still going to have to write a little report about what they did that day. They're still going to have to write a memo to their boss. They're still going to have to record something on a form. You can't avoid it these days. And I have a, a, a 
dear friend who's actually an Olympic athlete who has a, a bio posted on the internet about his illustrious athletic career, and it's full of grammatical errors. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, your value after the Olympics is over is going to go down when people look at the fact that you cannot even write a paragraph about yourself with correct sentences in it. This is a reality that we don't impress on our kids enough. Yes. So, would you advocate diagramming sentences? Yes. Oh, wow, that was just yeah, definitively. That's impressive. Just, like, Absolutely. Okay, because when I was in school and as I've been a teacher, there's always that one person in the building that still teaches diagramming sentences. Okay, diagramming sentences is our topic of discussion for those of you who are in the outer re mm -hmm. reaches, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's so, okay. It's a question of how it's done. Okay. Diagramming sentences is a wonderful tool. Um, it helps a lot of kids make sense. I had it in eighth grade, it helped me a lot. But there was a, a very good article in the American Federation of Teachers Journal called American Educator, maybe a couple of years ago, sweet little article about the value of teaching sentence diagramming that you all ought to look up. And with the basic way of doing it. Now, the issue is how far do you go with it because there is a limit to how valuable it is after you get the basic structures of sentences down. It is no longer productive to keep doing that. It is more productive to keep to do sentence combining, to do sentence refinement, to do to work on higher levels of verbal expression, better word choice, and all that. So it can be carried too far. It can be too rigid, uh, like a lot of things. So I would say it's extremely useful for teaching the fundamentals of structure and teaching that clauses modify certain parts of the sentence. Some clauses can be moved, some cannot. A compound has a certain parallel structure, whereas a complex sentence has um, an embedded clause and so on, to get those basic kinds of props. Also, so there's classic sentence diagramming for middle school kids. There's also um, something like Framing Your Thoughts from Project Read, which has what is in essence a diagramming process that makes sense to younger kids. It's extremely helpful. How many of you have had any training in Framing Your Thoughts? Okay. Um, the, okay, another thing where, you know, we have a handful of people. Framing Your Thoughts is out of um, the um, Language Circle Enterprises in Bloomington, Minnesota. It's a delightful way of teaching kids the basic structure of sentences. So those are all very good tools. Yes, thank you for asking. All right, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and talk about composition, shifting off of this basic stuff. All right, 10 minutes. So at five after, we'll start again, okay?
egregious of the state. And so one person said, I use four square writing. What are my thoughts about that? And since I am I have no knowledge of four square writing, would anyone like to say something about it? It's a graphic organizer. Okay. Um, and we'll be reviewing a lot of graphic organizers here. Um, okay. It's just a graphic organizer, but it's not a whole writing curriculum. Okay. Graphic organizers are good, so I can say that. All right. Um, and the best programs for teaching handwriting, uh, if I were to mention it, any more. I think I mentioned Suzanne or Blozer materials. Um, I, I think Curriculum Associates might have a handwriting program. Um, in all the Orton Gillingham based materials, there is instruction in how to teach handwriting. Uh, for, example, in, uh, for example, in the Herman reading method, which is for non readers who are fourth graders, fifth graders, there's instruction in handwriting. The Slingerland program, if you're ever trained in that, it's very based in how to teach handwriting. Diana King's materials, uh, which are educators' publishing service, teach handwriting skills to older students. So those are all good resources and materials for you. What about handwriting, handwriting without tears? Handwriting without tears, yes, that's one of ours. Yes, handwriting without tears, a wonderful company, wonderful materials. Okay, Loops and Other Grooves by Dr. Mary Bembo. I've heard of that too. Yes, that's all. Teachers seem to love that. It's good. Okay, that's great resource sharing. Um, and then there was a question on students with autism. And it's true they have difficulty committing handwriting shapes to motor memory. Do I have any information related to high functioning students with autism? And my answer to that is no. I really have no expertise in autism as such or anything that is unique or special about that population's ability to learn something like handwriting. So um, if anybody here does and wants to share resources with me, um, please do so. But maybe we'll have to leave that one hanging for now until we get better resources and better research, and I'll keep my eye out for anything that looks like it's worth pursuing. But I have to say, in my conversations with a lot of you during the breaks, I'm very impressed with your realization that the most important thing here is to look at research that pertains to the kind of students you have and what is going to work best for those students at their particular level of development. And that cannot be trumped by anxiety about the common core, because what will happen if those basic concerns are trumped by anxiety about the common core is that everybody is going to lose. Uh, because the students are not going to magically get over these issues and problems that require painstaking work. And just raising the bar higher doesn't make them jump higher, is that the same, right? Uh, however, there are some um, shifts that, that we have made. And here is, now let's talk about these higher level skills of composition that are so emphasized by the Common Core. And I had this slide in the morning's presentation, so this is for those of you who just joined us. I think one of the advantages of the Common Core, and I've had to, to um, shape my own thinking in the last couple of years as I've wor actually worked on the development of, of a, an intervention program for middle school kids, and we've had to really look at what the Common Core is asking for. So uh, the, the changes that we've made in accordance with the Common Core are to be very directive about what we want the kids to write about and what exactly we want them to do. So gone are the days of journaling and open-ended assignments and just write about your weekend and 
uh, tell me about the worst experience you ever had, and that kind of personal narrative that has been um, the genre of choice when we don't want to do the hard work of shaping writing to fit the standards or requirements of different genres. Um, and then uh, the emphasis on informational text writing, on reporting factually what someone has learned about something, which is the kind of writing we most often do as adults. You as teachers, you most often have to document what goes on in your classroom. Or you have to um, you have to write a lot of reports, right? You have to write reports on students. You have to participate in, in faculty uh, groups that write reports. You have to contribute to committees, and all of that is informational text writing. Um, a lot of you may weigh in on other uh, media as well. And that's more opinion, and um, probably we have avenues for writing opinions as well. But the emphasis is on the logic of what we say and the evidence base for what we assert in, in either argumentation or even in informational writing. Um, a requirement of that kind of writing is an understanding of text structure and an anticipation when we go about to write, when we go about the act of writing something, um, an anticipation of what that purpose requires of us, uh, the format that's required of us, if we write a contrast in comparison, or if we write um, a problem solution kind of um, essay. And then the last thing that has shaped what we're doing is the emphasis on writing in response to reading. Instead of writing whatever comes into your um, so we actually are enjoying working with these constraints. So they're giving us some real direction, and we think the results are going to be better. This morning, I showed this composition, and um, uh, we had a little fun with it. For those of you who just joined us, um, uh, it goes like this. I have to read this with you once again. A perfect weekend. This is a third grader. A perfect weekend. I got my hamster back, but she might not be pregnant. If she is, Buffy will be a grandmother and Star will be a aunt. We can use my father's workbench in the summer. I might change rooms with my brother. I wish we could get some ice cream and some hot fudge. <laughs> um, and this morning we used this as an example of a student who had received very little preparation for that composition. And what had happened was he walked into the classroom and in the guise of teaching writing, the teacher had a lot of 20 minutes, and she put on the chalkboard a perfect weekend as a title for what the kids were supposed to write about, and just sort of said, go for it. So over the years, what we've learned from research and experience is that if we want to get a better result, we're going to put more emphasis on the planning process. And if you think in terms of the amount of times, the amount of time that kids will actually be transcribing words on the page in relation to the amount of time that we will spend preparing them to do that. We're going to extend the amount of time in preparation so that the amount of time involved in transcription is actually less than it would otherwise be. Because a student who knows what they have to say and has the tools to say it and has decided on a format for doing that, has an idea of the audience that they're writing for, and has an image in their mind of what the final product is supposed to look like, is going to be more successful transcribing those words into a readable form than a student who is casting about, chewing the pencil, wondering what it is they should put on the paper next. Right? And most of the kids we have, and we talked about this this morning as well, most of the kids we have who are in the 
two-thirds to three-quarters who are not proficient, that is, the large majority are not proficient, need a lot of help at this. Now, it's not that kids don't have personal narratives to share. They have personal narratives to share, and they have feelings about things. But what they don't have is a sense of how to um, we say rein in the train of thought and direct it in a more formal way toward a purpose that's been defined. That's what needs to be done. All right. So to help kids with planning, um, and we said this morning just to make sure everyone's on the same page. We said that well, what do we mean by planning? We mean by we mean that the kids have to generate ideas. They have to have something to say. They have to set goals. Who am I writing for? How long is it going to be? What's it going to look like? Uh, what do I? What am I trying to do? Am I trying to inform people? Persuade people? Get something I want? React to something I don't like? Um, uh, uh, interest someone in a story? Or uh, information? What's my goal here? And then the organizations, the format. So um, let's talk about this. Generating ideas, number one. Generating ideas, having something to say. Nonverbal kids, and we have a lot of those, don't have a lot to say. Kids who have never been out of their neighborhood don't have that much to say. Kids who have never been spoken to by an adult in a conversation. Kids who come from those homes where they're not asked what their opinion is about it. Whose experiences are not mediated by language. And this gets back to the Hart and Risley study. I hope a lot of you know about that. Where the difference between, and some of you talked about working in lower SES communities, uh, and where, or where there's a high population of ELL kids, um, their parents are not talking to them in English after school about what happened during the day. There are not a lot of opportunities to process experiences verbally. So when they come to writing, they need a lot of support having those words and having those ideas already expressed um, before they can even begin to transcribe here are some of the ideas that I put on the slide, but um, I want you to take, and I'm, this morning we had partners, and so we, I wanted everybody to figure out if there was somebody next to them or near them they could talk to. So think about that, right? And I want you to take, um, let's take three minutes here, and have you talk about how you get your kids to have something to say. What are your favorite devices? What has worked for you? And to share a few ideas as a partner, and then we'll debrief. And these are some things I have found to be helpful. <laughs> and to start with that. <laughs> I 
And I think it's been easier for the kids to, to write about and um, kind of focused on two column note taking, which turns out to be main idea and details. Um, and it's been a really nice springboard into writing for them because it's easy for me to model. And then they can take their shared experience with the reading, and it helps me check their comprehension. And from that two column note thing, that's like a, it's like a key for, for paragraph and summary writing yes. for them. What and age are you talking about? Well, the ones that have, do, well, the ones that are the most successful are fifth grade and up. Okay. Fifth, sixth, seventh, but they are also several um, grade levels behind. I mean, lower than than their, uh, their grade level. So they're learning disabled kids, so it may be, Know, fifth grade reading, mm -hmm. and then the writing has been non existent for them. So, yeah. right, that's great. What is there literature that you can name that's been particularly uh, you mean stories? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I have to do short stories because we have to be able to um, finish the story, we have to be able to read the story in a, in a certain amount of time and then and then write mm -hmm. afterwards. So, I've had a lot of issues in. in and finding really good short stories, so um, that is based on good literature. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I've kind of gone to uh, that's another issue all in itself. But um, we use short, real short stories, and then we can talk about main idea, and and then there's a lot of modeling. There's a lot of modeling or group work. Yes, but. They are able to then start looking at what the, what they're going to put over in their in their uh, left hand column, which is the the main idea, and then pick out the details that support that. And then they know you can't write anything over here that doesn't that doesn't have something to do with this main idea yeah. over here. That's and it's been good. it's been pretty interesting. And this is kind of a new approach for you. For me, absolutely. Yeah. Because these kids are not writers. Yeah. And I did it more to check their comprehension. Yeah. Um, we're using Step Up to Writing as a yeah. school. Uh huh. And so there is a lot of um, there's a lot of talk about topic sentence, main idea, yeah. and uh -huh. details, okay. and color coding those things. Uh -huh. And so sure. that was a really good okay. good way to step into that. Right, that sounds wonderful. You're really in, head in the right direction. That's great. But I'm so glad and I can see how um, how um, excited you are that you're really getting some 
some progress results. from yes. the results. Uh, that's terrific. That's terrific. Anything else? I'm sure you have, you know, let's share a few more ideas. How do you get the kids you know, into it? How do you get them to have something to say? How do you get over that blank stare when they, you know, they're supposed to write? Yes. Um, I use Action Magazine. And, um, they Action they Magazine? Thanks for okay. And um, okay. there's always an opinion piece in there. All right. And so I like to have the kids um, kind of take a side and then support it. And then we're also an avid school, and so we do philosophical chairs, and they talk about it and debate it, um, and then go write about it. Okay, so you're you're really setting them up to formulate and express an opinion in response to an issue that's articulated. And what um, age level are you talking about? Um, six, seven, eight. Okay, it's very good, very good. What else is working for you? Come on, you guys, you were very verbal. <laughs> yes, too. Louisa, I want to share a resource that I found out about a few months ago. Um, it's called wordgeneration.org, and uh, it, it was a grant project that created this, and it's free materials, and it's all made up of short expository readings on issues that kids would be interested in, and it really emphasizes vocabulary. It was designed to be used across content areas. It was designed to be used um, in math, in social studies, science, and language arts. But you could do it in just language arts. You could do it in a special ed class too. And um, free materials, excellent short reading. Okay, thank and you. you. There are three versions of it. And there are three versions. Yes, yeah, so you could do it for three years. Yeah, yeah. yeah I saw that. They, they came out with some new materials. Excellent. So, Laura, do you have people using it in your district? Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Word generation. Anything else? Okay, yeah, but the idea I, I love. The, and what's happening in response to uh, writing in response to reading is that they, they have that common experience to share together. Um, one of the things that Judith Hoffman always points out in her workshops is that if you have an open-ended topic for kids to write about where you're trying to delve into their personal lives and personal experiences, that they, they, kids will start writing about things you don't want to be reading about. Um, and we discovered that in a in the um, Washington D.C. project, where I spent four years in the high poverty schools on the other side of the river, there where Congress never goes. <laughs> um, and um, we used a prompt that was supposed to be provocative for the kids, and the title was "When I Was Frightened." Tell me about a time when you were frightened. That was okay, such a can of worms. I learned from that. I didn't pick it. Somebody else on the research team picked it. The stuff those kids wrote about was awful, terrifying. You know, shootings in the street, boogeymen on you know, robbers, <coughs> domestic violence, everything under the sun, and they had lots of experience to share. But it wasn't really appropriate for them to do that in school. And we weren't ready to become social workers and psychotherapists. So that's another reason for constraining um, the activity to an academic setting where um, opinion writing is great, but it's fielded within um, civil discourse, we hope, um, and so on. <coughs> There's some lessons to a few people in that. Okay. All right, well, that's terrific. And this morning, also, we looked at a Winslow Homer painting um, because I would say that great art can also be your common experience. And it's a way of um, integrating some art history work or, or even uh, music study it as a prompt for kids to react to and write about. And you could. Someone who's over there said, well, yeah, well, while you're at it, you could show other Winslow Homer paintings and teach kids about Winslow Homer and the artist and when he was painting and what he painted about. And they should know about that anyway. Okay, so, all right. So then the second thing is setting a goal. And the goal, can I state what my purpose is? If you go tap that child on the shoulder, can you say, um, why are you writing this? Can they say, um, 
It is to inform, it is to entertain, it is to plead my case, it is to ask or persuade, it is to report faithfully what I understand about something. They should, in their own words, be able to tell you why they're doing that. Um, uh, and then, um, and so what do you think about this? Anybody want to reflect on this before I move on? About knowing why they're writing something? You see, you think your kids do know that, or that it makes sense for them to know that? They want. Okay. So it, the purpose should be. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank well, you. this will connect the last question with this question okay. as well of creating or generating ideas. Um, I teach a um, junior high population of um, students with intellectual disabilities that are ranging from a kindergarten level up to about a fourth grade reading level, I would say. So it's a pretty fairly broad range, um, but it's a life skills unit. And so I wanted this year to do a lot more with writing and also to create authentic purposes for them. So we're fortunate enough to get to go on field trips every two weeks out in the community. And um, so I have focused the majority of our writing this year on those field trips. So beforehand, we are creating a newsletter to go home to the parents explaining what the field trip is and why we're going. They have to fill out the district field trip activity consent form. So they're going to fill out forms. Um, and they um, afterwards, we do a lot of writing um, to, with authentic purposes. Sometimes it's to um, write a thank you letter to wherever we visited. Or other times, it is to um, write an email to their parents about what we did on our field trip, or we're keeping a classroom scrapbook and journal, and so sometimes it's in this classroom scrapbook or journal. So we always have a very real audience. Our writing is always shared with the population. We also have a partner elementary school that gets to come over and, and work with us every other Friday. So we do a lot of writing to share our experiences with them, and some photo journaling that goes along with that. and so. I've had a lot of success and they've been very excited about writing because it is all around shared experiences so we can dialogue a lot about it and then we're creating very authentic purposes aligned with every individual writing project we do. That's fantastic. Bravo. That's really great because you could so easily not do that with those kids and to um, that's wonderful teaching. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Yeah? Okay. Just having these kids come up with I can statements. Yeah, okay, so the comment was having kids come up with I can statements. This reminds me of Steve Graham's work on strategies and metacognitive strategies and having kids learn self talk. And one of the things I learned from him was if the student if the student says to themselves, if I can say it, I can write it. If I can say it, I can write it. That that simple thing counts. <coughs> okay, so I can stay. Very good. Yes. Hi. Um, the problem that we have with resource pullout, where then it's yeah. a really hard thing to find the time. So, um, I started last year with a lot of my writing time, um, trying to integrate science curriculum into the writing and so we would like uh, some of the days we would spend doing science experiments and then we would spend days writing about the experiments that we get. Oh that's fantastic. That's just great. And that's um, of course one of the goals of the common core that I think is is a, a valuable emphasis, the integration of content, meaningful content learning with language arts. Um, uh, I don't know if you all access the reading A to Z material for our younger kids. There's very substantive information in a lot of those little readings about ecology, environmental science, and um, how things work. And so the informational texts in there are good. And those also could be um, additional short texts for, for younger kids that you can use um, as prompts. OK, really good. Great ideas. Okay, and then the organizational part of planning. Um, and this is the part where it's, it has to be made clear to kids 
the format that they're writing is going to follow. Um, and, okay, cardinal rule number one, have them talk out verbally before they write. Uh, have them talk through what they're going to write. Even if when they set out to write, it doesn't come out the same way, the verbal rehearsal, whether it's to a partner, it can be a partner, it doesn't always have to be to you, the teacher, or the adult, or an aide, but they should be able to talk out what they want to say because um, uh, that, that kind of rehearsal, well, for one thing, it reduces the load on working memory when they're actually going through the transcription process because they have fewer things to think about. They already know what they want to say. Um, they can generate a bank of words before they transcribe uh, and ask for spellings for critical words. Or if you, if you have the class writing in response to the same prompt, you can have a verbal brainstorming with the group and create a word bank. Uh, you can give a model of what this final product might look like, and you need to say, is this going to be two pages? Is this going to be a book? Is this going to be, um, what, decorated or illustrated or not? Is, uh, is this to a formal audience? Is it informal? Is it within the family? Uh, what kind of words can we use or not? And then, uh, and then the key thing is the format and the structure of the text. So how do you deal with this? Expository text organization. Um, and let's focus on this first. So with expository text organization, we, I think almost from the beginning, have to be clear about what kind of exposition we're doing, if it's informational text. And each of these, I'm sure if you work with Step Up to Writing, it makes clear distinctions among these styles of informational writing. Um, most good writing curricula do that. So we have a difference here between a sequential piece that just tells you how to do something in order, or how to fix something, how to make something, how something happens in sequence. Um, that's different from um, uh, well, a narrative sequence of events where things happen over time. So there's a difference between a sequence of events and a procedure. And then a description is for creating a picture, um, a reason and evidence type of paragraph or essay has an assertion in the beginning, a statement of fact, and then brings evidence to bear to support that. And a comparison has to denote the similarities and differences um, between two things or ideas or texts. And then someone told me, well, I ought to add another one in here, which is the problem-solution format. But to me, that's kind of a subcategory of the reason and evidence format where, um, except you state what a problem is, like um, desert cities are going to run out of water unless they find ways to create fresh water sources in those desert environments. So that's a big problem humanity faces. So what are the solutions? You, know, you can pipe the water in from many miles away. You can desalinate the seawater if you're near the sea. You can recycle water and save every drop that you use, et cetera. So there are solutions you can talk about. All right, so let's consider what the graphic organizers would look like. Now, the, um, the, the four-square writing format is a type of graphic organizer, but it wouldn't fit every genre or every sub subtype of informational writing. So what we need to do better at, in a lot of instances, I think, is match the graphic organizer to the purpose or the structure of the writing that we want the student to do. And this kind of thing, um, I've seen a lot um, that this kind of, what do you call it, a web or a, what do you call it? Webbing cluster. Concept web, a webbing cluster or something. It gets used for everything when it's not really the best 
depiction of the logical relationships among the ideas. Where I think this really fits, this kind of webbing cluster thing, is if you're writing a description. Because there's no order to the ideas. It can be, you can order the ideas any way you choose. There are lots of ways of describing something. So if we ask a second grader to write about a description of her best friend, tell us about her best friend, well, she can fill out the boxes, what's her name, what does she like to do with her, um, uh, how does the person make her feel, uh, what kind of a person is she, what does she like to do. Uh, and then uh, if we want to support that even more, we can use, uh, and especially for younger kids, we have to teach them what it means to describe something. So we have to teach them the vocabulary and the categories of words that will help describe something or someone. And this is pretty standard stuff. So we have the words for how it looks, that sounds, smells, tastes, feels like, or moves, it does. In this case, a person um, can be described by their actions, their behavior. Uh, so here's an example of uh, a second grader writing about her best friend. So she wrote, this, and this is not a special ed student. This is a, one of those regular class students who would be in that category of the three quarters who need a lot of writing instruction to get. My best friend, oops, that's my phone. I'm sorry. OK. My best friend is Portia. I feel great when I'm around her. And when she comes over to my house, we go to the backyard and play tag and freeze tag. And she has a she has a good person a lot. You see that personality. Oh, personality. Thank you. I always wonder what that was. Okay. She has a good personality. Right. I think she is a great friend to take around the town. Um, <laughs> focus and hang out with her. Take around the town and hang out with her. You know, and it's not bad. Okay, this is second grade. She's learning how to write a paragraph. It's a description. She could put other descriptors in there. Uh, so there's some little detail, and there's a introductory sentence and she's a great person to hang out with and she could have maybe wound it up a little better and of course we have some problems with spelling here um, and actually for those of you who are interested in phonology here's a quick aside there are three errors here of her deleting a nasal sound before a final consonant as in around okay hang down here and around here. And uh, it just interests me that that particular sound gets dropped out of words. But um, she's doing all right. You know, she's probably in the average, low average range. Um, not too bad. She can spell great friend. What she's lacking is richness of expression and vocabulary. And if she had had more preparation, what would you have emphasized? If there had been more time spent planning, what might you have emphasized to get her to write something a little more rich and substantive? Somebody's mumbling it. Details. Details, OK. So that if she had, in fact, and, and I have to say I, I fudged this one because I went backwards from her composition to what a planning web might look like, but this would be the place before the student actually wrote to get her to verbalize uh, a, in, in somewhat more uh, vivid language and with more specificity and detail why she was, why she's a really good friend. It would be here in the planning state. So my, my point is here, if you spend more time up front you will spend, have to spend less time in revision, right? OK. So that's just a basic descriptive uh, format. And then um, a sequence kind of paragraph where 
let's see, one prompt we used with kids was, um, tell us how you would make breakfast for a friend. Tell us how you would make breakfast for a friend. Because we wanted to see if the kids could write uh, steps in order and if they could uh, use connecting words. And we're looking for first, then, next, and last, uh, and introduction and conclusion. So in the planning, you want a sequential order depicted. This, this, the web thing would not be right for sequential order. You have to get first, then, next, and last into the planning. It's a subtle, simple difference in how you represent what this composition is going to ask for. Um, if, uh, if you have to add more structure, and you do for a lot of the kids you work with, you have to actually give them a framework to put the words into at the beginning levels and supply these transition words until the kids learn to use them themselves. That's OK. You have to start where the kids are. Yes? I would say this is a great question because it really gets to the whole heart of the matter. Um, am I suggesting that you, you, because the kids don't have the basic skills, that you just focus on those and kind of can the work on composition? And I would say if you possibly can, to try to do both. But where you're going to adjust the composition requirements is you're going to give a lot more support and aids to help kids with the transcription process so they're not overloaded by that. And they can just focus on the conceptual organization of composition. That's your goal at this point. And you're going to relieve them of the burden of transcription by giving them a lot of the words or by doing a shared writing where you actually do some of the writing. And you're able to focus them for that 20 minutes or whatever on how you actually tell someone about a sequence. And then it matters that you have first, then, next, and last in there. And it matters the order of things. And the diagram. Well, then they do need to practice writing. So you have to kind of figure out the titration. With this, what you're doing, they can write here. But you're going to set them up to be successful because their end result is going to have some words that they put in. And they will rehearse them verbally first. And, um, th and then if they really struggle and they can't do that, then you show them a model of what a good one looks like. And they can fix theirs. But yes, I think you need to do both. Really, that's, trying, that, that's the main idea here. You need to do both. A lot of modeling, structure, use the graphic organizers, talk about text organization, and give as much support as you have to. And by that, I mean as much of a mold, M-O-L-D, for them to put the words into as, as you need. And then you fade off some of these prompts over time as they get better at it. Um, so this is this was the result with a second grader um, who was told to write this, and she actually, and this is kind of an intermediate growth step, right? She actually numbered the steps, and then she was very, she sort of composed it. First, you take the French toast out the bag. I <laughs> like there. Then you get a plate, syrup, and fork, and butter knife. Or that could be cup. I'm not sure, but I think it's syrup. Then you put the French toast in the toaster for two minutes. <laughs> then you get the French toast out the toaster. Then you put the French toast on the plate. Then you cut the French toast in half. Then you put the syrup on the French toast. Then you and a friend eat the breakfast. And <laughs> 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 uh, it's very cute. But she is not at the point yet where she can, without that, she can't form it into a, um, 
a paragraph that flows. That's the next thing she needs to do. But she has the sequential order piece, which is very good. And she's learned about the transition word, which is very good. So then you know where she needs to go next. All right, let's talk about the reason and evidence um, kind of paragraph, because this is more demanding of kids. And uh, there's a lot of emphasis in the Common Core on reason and evidence. Um, how do you set this up? Well, two-column two notes is excellent, because two-column notes, uh, two-column notes, you can have a main idea on details on the left-hand column and right-hand column. But here's another uh, kind of a structure that might work, uh, say, from third grade up. Right, if you study something together, you have read something together, and suppose it was about Paul Revere and his role in the American Revolution and why he's an important American to know about. What you might do to structure this is formulate some questions to put in the left-hand column. And then to get the kids to formulate their ideas and what they know about it, you then do a brainstorming with the group on the answers to those questions before the kids start to write. So you structure the task by asking the questions. And then they, um, it's a variation on two column notes, then they come up with the answers as a group. Of course, this is the term teacher language that I put in here. These are bigger words than kids might use at the third grade level. Um, but then you can you can formulate, you can either use phrases or you can formulate whole sentences. And then you leave this up for the kids to look at. And then when they have to write um, the reason why Paul Revere was a great American was that he blah, blah, blah. Or you can even give them that opening sentence and have the kids then fill in the details. So here's a composition from a student. And, and this gets to the, the, what we were just talking about. Okay, here's a student with severe learning disabilities. Actually, this student is in a special program for students with learning disabilities. And yet, the curriculum is rich. And it, it expects the kids to learn this content about history and science. Uh, so he was able to write, and this is after about three months of very intensive instruction where he is also getting a tutorial on spelling and handwriting and grammar and the basics of language, he is still expected to compose of, uh, about why Paul Revere was an important. So he writes, Paul Revere was important because he fought in the Revolutionary War. Mangled word there, but we know what he means. He made he made signs that showed that the British was evil. <laughs> he made the special code, or I think that's supposed to be sign. It made big. Uh, he made big bells for the church. He made gunpowder for the um, I think his people in war. And Paul Revere made metal boats. He attacked the British. And that's something, and and something the tea off the boats. So he knew he was in the tea party. Oh, true. You guys are really good at this. I think you've had a lot of practice. And he went to something his people to freedom. That is why Paul Revere helped the colonies. Okay, so what he has the idea of is the introduction, the conclusion, the details that need to be there the evidence that Paul Revere was an important American. So what's the teacher going to do? She's not going to grade spelling on this. She's going to commend him for engaging in that act of composition. And we do need to expect our kids to try to do this. We have to just be careful about how we handle it and how we give them corrective feedback and reinforcement and keep our eye on the prize, which is that what we wanted him to do was follow a thought process, and we wanted him to have a reason and evidence structure after studying this content, and he succeeded in that. So we know he can't spell revolutionary, but that's not the expectation right here. Um, I actually really like that example because it shows this is a kid with severe learning disabilities with all those problems we talked about, and yet 
in this curriculum, the um, expectations for kids learning the basics of science and social studies and history are high. It's just they do it in a very multi-sensory engaging way. But they do. All right, then, okay, an opinion, argumentation. Why you guys safe travel? I know some people have to leave. Okay, framing an opinion. Um, the most basic kind of frame, and little kids can do this. You just fill in the words. My favorite animal is. My favorite book is. My favorite um, activity is. Uh, what I want for my birthday is. Whatever. Um, because, and then we can show them through this kind of modeling how these transition words are used, how these logical connectors are used. Where it's like because and better than and especially that they might not naturally use themselves. And the expectation is minimal here for filling in some of the words. And even if they can't spell them, I would have them do this because they need to learn what it means to express an opinion and share their opinions and realize that other opinions, other people's opinions won't be exactly like theirs. Here is uh, uh, this is a third grader, okay, and he was asked to write about his favorite animal, and, I, and it's just hard to read, but you can get the idea of how severe the learning disability is for this third grader, and this was before a lot of remedial instruction took place, and it's barely legible. There are all kinds of problems with um, dysphonetic spelling, poor handwriting, lack of spacing, let alone what he's trying to say. And what's important, though, I wanted you to see is that with, with about four months of instruction, what happened was he progressed from that to this. And I'm sorry, I cannot get the copy to come out better, so I retyped it here. But you can see a qualitative improvement in the amount that the student writes, the student's confidence that um, that he can express an opinion about his favorite animal, that he has a strategy for doing that, which is to write a topic sentence, and then to give some details, and then to um, wind up with a restatement. So he can learn that. Um, uh, one of my favorite animals is a puppy. A puppy, a puppy is so cute, I used to never see one because my mom is allergic, but my cousin has one. I get to see him or it every time I go to Chicago. <laughs> I really like playing with puppies. It's like a little brother or sister because, uh, oh, I know what that says, dogs. That said dogs. Um, dogs are really one of my favorite animals. He also goes to speech, obviously. He goes to speech. <laughs> he goes to speech, and he has a very structured language program where he is learning speech sound awareness and phoneme graphing mapping and basic spelling, high frequency words. But even though he's learning that, he's also learning how to write a paragraph. Okay, so this is this is and this is a real progress. This is four months of progress in this special program music. Now for older kids who are beyond that, we need to give them a graphic organizer for a reason and evidence passage that, that lays out what they're supposed to do. So um, I like this one. Uh, they have to assert what their opinion is or make their assertion, then give a reason or cause for that. Um, then. Uh, this doesn't have to be limited to three contributing reasons why that assertion is uh, true. And these are lines for details here. So this would be a multi-paragraph piece and then a closing statement down here. But this, you know, this is very different from just a, a, a web or even a sequence um, or um, something with a different logical structure. I showed this one. Oh yeah, I showed this one this morning. Okay, um, so this is this is the result 
for a kid who's been taught to use a graphic organizer like that. And for those of you who weren't here this morning, I just, I just had to share this with everybody. The perfect age is to be 25, because he was asked to us make um, uh, an argument about what the perfect age would be. And he was 16 at the time he wrote this. So the perfect age is to be 25 years old, because that's when you have a real girlfriend that's perfect for you. And hopefully she's pretty and nice, and also because you can pay less on car insurance and some other things. Some other reasons is so you can get a better job, make more money, have your own house and boat or whatever, be famous at something, reach your peak of most things, whatever that means, also get close to marriage and have kids, forget everything bad that ever happened to you when you were younger, and get engaged to the perfect girl uh, for you. That's all I can think of, so uh, I can't wait till I'm 25. <laughs> he has a reawakening coming. Uh, that's all right. um, but again, Okay, severe learning disabilities, severe dyslexia in this case, and he has still been taught how to compose and how to go through that step of reason and evidence, reason and evidence, and with argumentation, a position or assertion, and your reasons for your belief or your assertion or your opinion about something, which is really very nicely done from a substantive standpoint. All right, um, color coding paragraph structure. Uh, this is uh, the idea of color coding. I know that it's embedded in step up to writing. Um, and what else? And in the language curriculum, color coding uh, has been adopted in the language curriculum. Um, great. Uh, this is a wonderful tool for showing kids in a very concrete way the relationships among ideas and organized text. Um, the color coding I've suggested here is not the same as it is in those programs. Uh, they use, I think, set up to write and use this green for the top of the sentence. Um, uh, the reason I put topic sentence in blue is that it's like the sky, the overwriting thing. And then green is the transition between the blue and the yellow. So if you write a second sentence that's an elaboration of the topic sentence, that's like green to me. And then yellow, additional details. You could add even more details, which is red. And, get, and then the light blue is a restatement that harkens back to the first sentence, but restates it somewhat differently, because you don't want kids, if they can, use different words. Um, you don't want them just to say exactly what they said in the beginning. Any other comments about color coding anybody wants to offer? All right, how about, um, how about um, narration? OK, we've been talking about expository text. And now what about narration? or story writing, storytelling. Um, it took me, personally, a long time to realize something about what makes a story work. And it's funny how we can, we can go through life with these things in front of our noses, but unless somebody really tells us what we're supposed to notice, we don't always do that. And the insight for me that someone explained, I don't know, I must have been in my 30s or something, is that a story is not a story unless it has a problem in it that has to be solved. Sometimes we represent a story as a sequence of events, but that's not it at all. What makes a story work is that there is a protagonist or a person, a character, a something, that is trying to solve a problem, and that gets it, it gets resolved in some way. The story has an ending to it, and that whole idea. I, I mean, how many stories had I read before I was consciously aware of that? 
And when we're teaching kids about story structure, it's not just that the story has a beginning, middle, and end, which is where you might start with very young kids, like the kindergarten kid who was writing about, I think I showed this morning, writing on and on about the prince and the princess in the castle, and the prince was dragging the princess around by her hair, you know, there were these little rumpled still skin and whatever in the story. And it went on and on. And the only reason it ended was that the kid ran out of paper. <laughs> so the first thing we do have to get across is beginning, middle, and end. But as soon as kids have a little more uh, ability to kind of take in what the whole story is about, it's this that really makes it. What is the problem the character has to solve? Because if it's just a narrative, you know, when you ask a young child, you have a five-year-old, you say, okay, did you see? And then he says, we saw a video today in class. Okay, great, what was that about? And you get this string of, well, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. Okay, good, but I still don't really get it, you know, with this whole thing is about. Because what they're, if they're really young, they're not able to conceptualize this. They have to grow into that. So this is a, a start point here. The story outline, beginning, middle, and end. And, and of course, uh, these basic questions are what guide the student into thinking about what's going to be the story. When and where did it happen? And of course, that's the setting. Who is it about? Of course, that's the characters. And what's the problem? And that's, that's going to drive this story. We're going to have to have some transition words. And then we're going to have to know how this problem was solved and how the story ends. They should plan that before they write. If they don't have that in mind before they write, there will be no ending. It will just kind of stop, and it's not very satisfying to read. Um, a slightly more sophisticated graphic organizer has characters setting plot. Then, so the problem was part of that plot, first event, second event, third event, Climax and resolution, and then again, it's the questions we need to ask kids in the planning process. Okay, who is this about? Who else is it about? Where does it take place? What are they going to be doing? How are they going to get to the resolution of this problem? How are you going to wind things up so they have that in mind before they start? Um, and then this writing sample was actually what happens when kids start to write what should be a story and they don't have that plan in, in place. So this one goes, I am Erica, I work hard for ribbons and horseback riding. Once I got first place for a pattern and second for my classes, one of my classes, I got judged on my horse color and how my horse looked like his coat and color. One time I almost got no ribbon at all, but I did. I got sixth place. If you get first, you can get a trophy sometimes. Nah, nah, hey, whatever that is. I think it means nay, nay, hey. Okay, so she's told us some things. If we had this job in front of us and we could walk her through what I just showed before she started to write about getting ribbons and horse shows, we might say, okay, we're gonna, what would you like to make a story about? I'd like to make a story about my experience in a horse show. Okay, that could be a really good story. Let's figure out how to make it an interesting story. What is the real problem that you're facing uh, when you go into a horse show? Get her to think about that. Well, what would make an interesting story as far as how you might solve a problem of how to get through the horse show or win first place? You know, and what might happen to get in the way of that and how would you solve that? That's something we might want to read about. So kids need some feedback about what, you know, what, what we're talking about here. What, what is the issue? Because the way she writes, it's just kind of train of thought. It kind of is like a narrative, but it isn't really a narrative. 
but she, I don't think she knows what a narrative is supposed to contain. Because she might say, as an introduction, um, um, I had worked so hard for ribbons in horseback riding, uh, but never won one until you know last year. Um, Lots of things got in my way, or you know, things just weren't right until then, or whatever. And then she could tell us how she got to that first place. I I want to read like that. All right. If you, how much time? When am I supposed to stop? Three thirty. Three thirty. Okay. I'm getting there. Okay. Supporting transcription. Uh, these things we've talked about, and this morning I put a big emphasis on the fact that most kids with writing problems are poor at transcription, meaning spelling, handwriting, grammar, sentence structure, and getting the words on the page. So how do we minimize the impact of those learning disabilities on the outcome? We talked through the ideas first, keep the plan visible. Make a word bank if we can, which words they think they're going to use. Write every other line on yellow paper so the student knows it's not a final copy. Draw one line through changes. Use, use uh, editing marks for making changes. And then uh, self-talk all the way through. This is the strategies. Who's going to read this? What am I telling them? What is my goal? Uh, so that they remind themselves to stay on track while they're writing. These things help. Um, all right, so we did this uh, this morning. We looked at another Winslow Homer painting called The Gulf Stream, where there's this guy, um, uh, he looks like an African who is on a boat by himself in the sea, and the mast is broken, and the sharks are around, and the sea is pitching after a storm. And it's an ambiguous kind of a painting, very interesting. So here's another Winslow Homer painting. Um, and uh, this is a famous one. It's called Snap the Whip. Um, and we could have, in the old days, before the Common Core, we could have said, let's write about this painting. But now what we want to do is think more carefully, what kind of writing do we want the kids to do? And so we have a couple of minutes here. Um, I want you to talk for a minute in your small group or with the person next to you. How might you use this as a prompt? And can you see the possibility of some kind of narrative, uh, some kind of informational writing, or some kind of opinion writing? Think about that. How, how the assignment might fit a specific genre, what you might do. So just, just think about that. The assignment you might give kids about this painting and talk with the person next to you, see if you can come up with some ideas. <coughs> Thank you. 
Picture and describing that person and giving evidence based on what they saw. Oh. Like why is the one boy holding on to the kid at the end and what happened to the kid who fell? And yeah. yeah, very good. And and um, so if you really look at this picture, there there's a lot to say about. You can speculate about these kids and look at this one out front here. Is he kind of making the <coughs> Really snapping. This this one looks like the aggressor to me. <laughs> That's the one I'd pick for your assignment. <laughs> okay. That's great. Yes. Um, we were talking about the shift from ruralism to urbanism in the literature wow. shift, and how this would be a really great pictorial reading of that. <clears throat> and. Um, you could describe the, you know, the, the shoes are off, the wondering schoolhouse, I and mean, just the, how a society was structured in the time when it was grown. 1880 versus now. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Good in, informational text writing. Come on, there are more ideas, I know. Oh, okay, yes. I think you could do one, um, an expository on the, the um, kind of content of the painting, the use of color, the use of perspective, um, all the, the, the artistic components that the artists use to make that painting. That would be wonderful, and that's a completely different kind of assignment, an analysis of the technique of the artist in creating this image. And then the kids need the vocabulary of color and form and perspective and um, uh, content and uh, color, yes, and discuss all that, which you would have to do if you were in an art class. And it requires a special vocabulary. Um, I love that. I love that. I love that. Okay. Louisa? Yes. Would it be okay if I want to take my class outside and like experience this? I mean, I'm just thinking maybe some. You kind of fun to take the kids out and yeah. let them experience and then we'll yeah. come and write about it. If, if you can get them to take their shoes off and roll up their pant lace and put their hats on. Put their hats on. <laughs> get the girls and the boys together. Yeah. This is one of the oldest games kids have ever played, right? They're probably still doing it on the play. Okay, yeah, wonderful. Know, you see. Snap the whip? I'm like, it's like Red Rover, except it doesn't really have the Red no. Rover. No. Oh, it's a game? You're so young! <laughs> okay, it's a game where, it's, you see how I'm ice shows? Connie, you were inside diagramming sentences. <laughs> The idea is to make the kid on the end fall off because that 
circle is going around. Like you do it on ice skates. And the points over here. Anyway, we hope you have that experience. Right. At some point. <laughs> okay, so let me show this. Uh, we talked about building sentence sense. We talked about all this. Um, all right, let me say something about this. It, I, I love what you all just contributed, and I'm sure there are a lot more great ideas there because you really are grasping. Um, what these standards are after, which is to shape the writing exercise, be more teacher directed, have people respond to a common experience together. Um, and uh, while we're also adjusting these tasks for kids with learning disabilities, you have to be careful about how we do feedback and revision. So, with the kids with learning disabilities, focus on content before the transcription issues um, uh, comment on the organization because that's the main focus of the composition exercise. Did you write about what you were supposed to write about? Did you stick to the point? Did you provide details and evidence in relation to the topic? Um, focusing on verbs. Um, and then if you're going to work on sentences with kids, one way to do that is to lift sentences out of kids' writing and show how you can do a sentence combining activity with those sentences or you can practice punctuation or something like that. Um, uh, da, da, da. Editing. Give kids editing lists that they can manage. You cannot have kids responsible for everything on the Common Core Standards list. It's not going to work except for your advanced and proficient writers because it's overload. You know, they can't do everything at once. So you have to build up capacity to focus on and self correct these things. And of course, you start with did I capitalize I? Did I capitalize the first word? Did I put in punctuation? And then the other things get added in gradually. We want to teach kids editing symbols if we can. Um, sentence lifting. And the last step, publishing. I just love all the things you said about authentic reasons for writing and the, and the way that you publish the work of your class. Um, writing is a form of communication. If you don't have contact with an audience, you forget really why you're doing it. And in this day and age, it's easy for kids to kind of avoid writing unless we uh, define the purpose, give them the experience, uh, communicate the importance. And perhaps um, the the overwhelming message of this is that we have to have kids writing a lot. So how do we manage that when our class size is 40 kids or 35 kids and it's just you and your kids? You can have kids write a lot and then sample the ones that you read and give feedback to. You can have kids accumulate work in a folder and then sit down with you periodically and review it with the student and maybe throw out things they don't want to keep and keep other things to polish. Um, you can have peer feedback and peer conferencing where kids help each other get to the heart of the matter of whether they have written enough to inform their friend about something that they're writing about. You can um, you can use instructional aids to help give feedback if you have them. There are a lot of things you can do, but even if you can't get to the supervision and feedback process of everything kids write, just the act of sitting down and writing something and getting in the habit of doing that is very important. Because back to where we started, writing is the most difficult language skill we undertake. It takes the longest to learn. It's mastered by the fewest people. And one of the reasons why that's so is that we don't practice it enough. Um, a very astute person, I'm not sure she's still here, pointed out to me earlier that students in Great Britain are better writers than we are. And why is that the case? Because their teachers require them to write a lot and to 
um, and to express themselves often. So a lot of this is like anything. If, even if you're not naturally good at it, you get a lot better at it if you, if you do it a lot. So with that, I think I will just wind up and say thank you very much and see if there are any other questions I can answer in the um, last 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just have one other um, source that might be helpful. Thank you. It's called uh, First Author. The first author by uh, the Don Johnston Company. Okay, the first author by the Don Johnston. It's a software program. Okay. And it takes, it takes you through stages right. of writing. Good, software, good. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. All right. And yes. you were wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. It's been a great day. Thank you so much. Uh, there's one other. Um, so what I want to make you aware of that, 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 that came aware to us at the UPDC through Dr. Anita Archer, that, that's a colleague and friend of yours. She, she turned an app with us while ago called Explain Everything. It's available on the iPad and the Android. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal tool that allows you to take some written text from a student, sit down with that student, and you can hit the record button and you can use your finger or stylus and you can actually be making comments and talking. It turns into a little video for that student to have later on to get feedback. It's a great way to get feedback. It's called Explain Everything. Just go to explaineverything.com. It'll explain everything to you. So enjoy it. Uh, but I think with, with, the, with the feedback, I mean, excuse me, the information we got today from Dr. Moss on the importance of feedback yeah. to students, this is a great way to facilitate that. So uh, from the UPC, we, we thank Dr. Moss for being here. Thank you so much. We will follow up with uh, some of her stuff. Please check back on our consortium website. We'll have some We'll, we'll have these uh, experiences archived for you to look at. And we wish you a Merry Christmas and safe journey. Make sure you grab a certificate on your way out. And thanks so much. <laughs>